That's what this is all about, is your right to freedom of speech. What made America great is an independent, vigorous press. If a jerk burns a flag, America is not threatened. Political speech is the heart of the First Amendment. We're expressing their religious belief. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all the God's children. Welcome to Speaking Freely, a weekly conversation about free expression, the arts, and America. I'm Ken Paulson. Since the founding of Jefferson Airplane in 1965, our guest has produced an extraordinary body of music, sometimes popular, sometimes provocative, sometimes both. We're delighted to welcome Rock and Roll Hall of Fame member Paul Kantner. <laughs> Not long ago, Paul, the Washington Post called you the political conscience and space cadet of the Jefferson Airplane. <laughs> uh, do you plead guilty as charged? Oh, and more. Were you really the, the political force behind a very political band? No, no, we're a very apolitical band if you really analyze it. And have, we have the luxury of coming from San Francisco, which is very uh, nutritious for off the beam, off the normal beam kind of people, and, and, and nurtures them really in its own way. And we, uh, in, in contrast to say Berkeley, for example, in the 60s, uh, or the SDS or the Weathermen, chose and got away with creating our own alternate quantum, if you will, universe type of place where we, rather than going up against City Hall and fighting City Hall, like I'm sure you, you're, you, all of you are probably engaged in doing, we had, and I must admit it's a luxury, the ability to get away with not fighting City Hall, but in a sense creating our own City Hall without all the bureaucracy and just going out and, and establishing an ability to do what we wanted to do. And for some reason, we got away with it. I have no idea. I always say that if I'd been born anywhere else in the country than San Francisco, I'd have probably been executed by now. <laughs> or, uh, and in so doing, it, it caused a lot of people who do the fight that the normal ACLU and the people do uh, get involved in got a little resentful of us and called us sort of irresponsible hedonists and that whole sort of thing. But there, there was a, a, a real, what would be the word, commitment to uh, establishing our own place with our own laws and our own rules. And we somehow, I don't know why, to this day, got away with it. Well, you talk about the band as being apolitical, but... Not apolitical, right. but we didn't deal in the normal political spectrums and, and submit ourselves to Congress and, and, right. and, and, and deal with City Hall and yeah. ask. I went to Catholic school and, and long ago I, I learned it was much easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, <laughs> as we see in Catholic <laughs> school. And, so, and so, nobody ever hammered us down. Um, Yorma, our lead guitar player, always thought that we were part of a CIA LSD experiment. <laughs> and so that whenever we would go out across the country, they would go in ahead of us and tell the local police department, don't arrest them. They're okay, we got an eye on them, it's, it's part of the program. Because <laughs> we just got away with the most ridiculous kind of stuff. Of course, uh, even if you had that clearance from the CIA, that didn't prevent certain police chiefs in certain towns from pulling the plug on the show. Well, they probably knew the, the message lights. or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And when the police and, and, or the church people or whoever would make a protest to us, uh, in contrast to the normal ACLU kind of approach, it would heighten our sales. You know, it, and we would go out and debate with church leaders or politicians or policemen about this, that, or the other thing, and it would, it would be like the publicity, really. Okay. Even going to jail, the few minor times that we were put in jail, it got written up in all the papers. And so there was no conscious effort to create some problem for anybody other than the usual <laughs> of just being. Uh, we were just doing what seemed to be the thing to do at the time. So uh, you literally were not trying to start a revolution with volunteers. We were, the revolution had been going on. Black Panthers and all that had been working in Oakland since the early 60s. And, uh, that, and the Weathermen and the SDS had been reflecting since the early 60s. And the free speech movement in Berkeley had an effect on everybody. And uh, Country Joe and the Fish were doing the same thing from Berkeley. And uh, that was just a, a fulmination of events that we were happy to be part of. You know. Your music. Uh, from the beginning in the airplane, it was different from other people, and I, I have to believe you never aspired to be Bobby V. It was always I was a child of the Weavers. I was ra not raised on the Weavers, but when I came into music, I was musically raised by the Weavers. They were the first person who struck me as a a force. They eventually became the uh, the form from which I wanted to be the kind of band I wanted to be in. And when we started our band, this was the template that. Uh, unconsciously, anyway, uh, I said, well, Marty asked me the first night he met me, he said, you want to start a band? 
said, yeah, I could, we could do that. Uh, but there has to be a woman in it. Because I had always been swept away by uh, the work of Ronnie Gilbert, uh, the woman singer in The Weavers. And uh, we just went uphill from there. The Weavers had a great combination of both uh, hedonism on the Lee Hayes side, all the way through the re social responsibility and the, the, the powerful singing, and uh, into the total ascetic, almost Amish approach of Pete Seeger to life. Uh, so uh, I, I was talking to Ronnie about it once before, and I said, it looks to me that your band, like our band, all combined together make one sort of complete human being, you know, with all their faults and all their uh, 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 vices and virtues. Uh, they combined to make one whole unit that was very impressive to me, so I, I built what was our band on, on a unconscious, actually, but uh, a format of what the Weavers had done, both in social responsibility and in terms of doing benefits, in terms of helping people that you were in a position to help, because it's so easy as a rock and roll band to go out and, and raise a large amount of money for a serious cause, which most people cannot do, and all we have to do is just, like, go out and play. <laughs> and uh, so not to do it almost becomes a sin in, in the Catholic sense, a sin of omission. And it's so uh, easy to do, and the Weavers made it look easy, despite all the McCarthy and the HUAC hearings, uh, made it so easy to do to help so many people so quickly that that's one thing that, that I tried to do with our band as well. You know, you talk about you lived a charmed life and you've gotten away with a lot of things, and, mm -hmm. and yet, if you look at the newspaper reports, magazine reports from the 60s and 70s, there's no band that has been banned so often. As, oh, all right. As, as a, you, you, the, the plaque is <laughs> what a band is yeah, supposed to yeah. do. That's, that's, um, that's why they call it a band. band. <laughs> I see. Thanks for clearing that up. The uh, there are radio stations who wouldn't play your stuff. Um, Spiro Agnew attacked you. Uh, any number of politicians ran on platforms in opposition to to Jefferson Airplane. Justly so. Absolutely. And then any number of people saying that you were. Satan's children. And the song goes, everything that they say we are, we are. Yeah, exactly. And we are very proud of that. That's right. Um, when did you get the first sense that Jefferson Airplane um, was going to make waves, that there would be some, and there would be some backlash to what you're doing? Oh, for me, it was the second grade military school. <laughs> <laughs> you knew that. I just carried on the devil's advocate. When, when I learned of the devil's advocate in, in uh, the eighth grade or so, I, I, I thought I'd found my position in life. Uh, and, and just carried on. It, it was a natural... We didn't have radio stations that played our kind of music when we started, or nightclubs. We had to build our own nightclub. Uh, our, our scene co co uh, concocted their own radio stations, not searching for any commercial viability. We didn't expect to make any money. We weren't there to make money. It was almost an irrelevant point of contact with society. We were there to, God knows what we were there for, just to do what was to be done. For a band that never embraced commercial success, how did you come up with I mean, kind of classic singles like Somebody to Love and White Rabbit? Those were huge records. Um, no attempt to create a hit record out of that? No. When they first put the record out with those songs on them, they didn't even take those songs off to put out as a single. I mean, they sort of uh, automatically put out a single when you put out a record. And they chose some other much less obnoxious song to put out on the radio. And, and, it was <laughs> and then some radio stations started pulling those, those songs off. And right. they just bloomed on their own. <clears throat> I know you're, you're always amused by criticism, but you had to be particularly entertained by, by the attempt to censor, to ban White Rabbit. What was that all about? The obvious, isn't it? Well, drugs. And, and, it, <laughs> and, and you intended it to be, uh, as Spiro Agnew said. The war on said, drugs has been going on ever since, and as with most American governmental wars, it's a pathetic failure. <clears throat> so you know, we have the war on hunger, the war on homelessness, uh, the war on drugs. What, what do we have left? The, the war on fat. The war on <laughs> smoking, the war on uh, what Saddam Hussein. So when, when all of these wars, America has lost since I was born. So when government officials suggested that a band like Jefferson Airplane was talking to the young people of America in code or not such code to encourage them to use drugs, absolutely no, right. No, no, not at all. That people made such a blossoming thing out of drugs because it's the obvious tack on point. But for us in San Francisco at the time, LSD was legal when we started. It, it, it was not banned. Um, and we, we had been taking it for several years before that, before we had become a band, uh, just experimenting with life as teenagers or young 20s do, and uh, successfully, most, mostly, uh, Art Linkletter's daughter not with, notwithstanding. Uh, most of the people who took LSD had no particular problems with it. And 
the culture made such a huge thing out of drugs, uh, when in reality it was just like a, a minor dessert at a really fine meal. What was going on in San Francisco at the time uh, was like what was going on in Paris in the 20s or New York in the 30s. Uh, in my case in Nicaragua even in the, uh, in the 80s when I went down and visited. Is that the, those cities at that time uh, for some reason attracted people from all over the world because of what was going on there. And, and as I went to Nicaragua just to find out what was going on, people came to San Francisco in the 60s to find out what was going on. And everybody from Rudolf Nureyev, who got caught running across the rooftops of the Haight-Ashbury at a police bus, uh, to mayors and baseball players and famous musicians, and uh, were drawn there to see what was going on. And the glory of those moments is that you're thrown into this cauldron with all of these scintillating, uh, uh, vital uh, people uh, coming together in this big sort of clash, uh, the way Mel Brooks used to describe the uh, making of the Jewish star, you know that story? The six guys with points came together in the room and <laughs> just all smashed together. Uh, all of these forces came into a confluence with each other and just exploded and, and there was a one and one equals five kind of situation there that it, it enticed and, and explored and exhilarated all of us. And, and you look for those places, and I'm sure they go on today, like Prague was about 10 years ago after the communist downfall uh, became a, uh, an explosive place. Uh, I'm waiting for the next one to, <laughs> to look up when it happens. I love those places. They're really exhilarating. The, uh, it's like whitewater rafting. You know, you're in a, in a craft going down this whitewater through curves. You, you have not the slightest idea of what's going to be around the next corner. And you're trying to keep the boat, and you're in there with a bunch of people, and you're whatever. And you could crash on a big rock at any moment, but I have never had any fear of going down in flames. Uh, you know, it's it's almost like World War One fighter pilots. It's almost your destiny. And if you don't, then you're condemned to an old age life in an age old age home where you really don't want to be. You know, so one of the uh, areas that record companies and television companies and others censor often, it, as you mentioned, has to do with language. Sometimes it has to do with drugs. Um, and there's a song brought to you by uh, David Crosby when the bo birds would not record, record try, it. try it. So of course we want to so do you, that. So <laughs> you record that, uh, which is a song ab about a threesome. Is it tougher to get bandmates and others to write candid songs about sexuality? You, you have, you know, there are very few songs. We've never had problems with sexuality. <laughs> it's just sexuality run rampant. Uh, totally, the doors crashed down as they needed to be and should have been, and. Um, a great Grecian balance was struck, I think, in my life particularly, uh, on understanding sexuality, coming in, uh, face to face with it, much less cowering in a corner like an Irish uh, washer maid uh, about it. Uh, it was just a celebration and a joy. And even to this day now, I think it's, it's, it's our duty as well as those of you who want to take up the, the flag to pursue joy and, and, and ecstasy and passion in life because God knows there's precious little of it to be had just waiting for it. And so pursuing it and cutting your own path through a forest is, is something that we've had the luxury again of doing uh, in San Francisco uh, without getting severely uh, arrested or anything like that. You've gone out uh, after the, the volunteers' ears and, and uh, Bark and some other great work by Jefferson Airplane. During that period, you began to develop your own material, Blows Against the Empire. What, why did you set out on your own? Were there things you had to do that group you couldn't do? A group, as most groups do, eventually get to a point where you each want to do more of what you do, and there's not enough room for all of you in the band, I think is probably the answer to that. And we just naturally fell into that kind of position. And you coined the phrase Jefferson Starship initially. A logical extension. Right. I was the science fiction one in the band. So when I started a new band, and I wanted to carry on what we had been doing. Uh, it seemed just logical. And, and the first album that I did was a science fiction album about stealing the first government starship that was up there. Hijack was, was a really bad word to say, you know, in airports in those days. So I figured, okay, let's hijack the starship. Uh, and so it was just, just a logical. Uh, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at your work from that point on, there's, you know, this band that you describe as not being concerned about commercial appeal early on. Suddenly, well, we had no objection about commercial appeal. We just weren't very commercial. But eventually, you were. I mean, suddenly there well, were. I think you can get count the number of hits we've had in our career on one hand, really. When you uh, recorded with a new lineup, 
uh, and a new old lineup. You had a band called the KBC Band. Yeah. And, uh, and this was a band that uh, had one album uh, and had uh, a clear point of view and had a particularly remarkable song in there called America. Was that the kind of song you couldn't do with whatever Starship had evolved oh, into? Oh, no, not at all. That, came, that was being written as I was leaving the Starship. And as we focused into the next band, it just became the song. Can you talk about that song? And, and uh, it's really well received. I've seen you do it recently. For not being a major hit, it's, it's close to the hearts of a lot of people who are fans of your work. Yeah, the Democratic Convention used it un, 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 without permission in the uh, convention for, who was the bozo before uh, the last convention? Oh, Clinton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, they played it on one, of, one of the nights, and I, because uh, I'm not, I, I'm, I really have no fascination with politicians at all and find most of them a pretty sorry lot. Uh, and and I, it's a very hard job, and I respect the people who do go into that sea and deal with all of that crap, because I, I just couldn't imagine doing it myself. But uh, the song, I, I'm an American. I was born, fortunately, in California. But uh, all over America, it's a, an extraordinary country, and what's going on here is extraordinary in the history of the world. And as much as we, with our rights as Americans, to confront what we feel needs confronting in America. That's one of the glories of America, that we can do that without getting killed outright. Uh, so so that, that's a sort of a celebration of America. At the same time, uh, both celebrating it and addressing some of the, uh, the, the, the bad sides of America that might needed some kind of address. We have that facility to do that, both as musicians and as Americans. And it's, it's a very celebrational song. Uh, I, I started with a, a fugue in the beginning of it, sort of not directly stolen, but emotionally stolen from the work of Aaron Copeland, who I really in, in, enjoy and, and who really moves me as a musician. And the beginning fugue of, uh, of the song is <laughs> total Aaron Copeland steel, but not really, because we changed things, you know. In the roughly the same period, you, you took a trip to Nicaragua in the late 80s. What was the fascination there? I had run across, I'm very fond of, uh, what's the word? What are those women who have two things? Bipolar women. Bipolar women who drink are the most uh, exciting <laughs> uh, women that I've run into as a general rule. And I ran into this story of Nora Astorga, who was a lawyer in Managua before the during and before the revolution succeeded in 1979. Um, and her story had been that she had been a, a lawyer who worked downtown, like on, what's the street, Madison Avenue or something, type lawyer, uh, but secretly was supportive of the Sandinistas and would do this, that, and the other thing for them in her capacity as a downtown lawyer. And there was this general who was, General Vega, something or other, who was uh, hustling her and wanted her to be his concubine, this, that, and the other thing. She would keep putting him off and off and off. Finally, one day, uh, they concocted a plot to uh, lure him up to her apartment and to take him prisoner uh, and hold him uh, ransom-wise for the release of several Sandinistas who were in jail at the time. And when he got there, he, got in, he was very macho about it, and they got in a big fight, and he ended up being killed. So at this point, Nora has to flee into the mountains because everybody knew where he was going and what he was trying to do. And she stays in the mountains until the revolution, fighting uh, in Mufti in her military outfits and this, that, and the other thing. And then when they won, uh, the Sandinista Council appointed her as a Nicaraguan ambassador to the United States. Reagan immediately refused her because the guy they had killed had been a CIA contact. And so there was a little bad blood there. So uh, in retaliation, they appointed her as representative to the United Nations, which Reagan had no control over. And it's, it's about this time I run, run across the story, and I said, whoa, this is some woman. <laughs> this is nice. And uh, I hear that she's coming to San Francisco to speak at Glide Memorial Church. So using my whatever uh, powers of rock and roll, I inveigle my way into the National Lawyers Guild and, and ask for a ticket to the show. And, and I get to meet her, and we get to talking and exchanging. I had written a song about her, actually, called Marielle on the KBC album. And, and she heard it, and we talked. And I said at some point in the conversation, I'd love to come down with my band to play in your country. And she says, oh, come right ahead. We'd love to have you. We're having a celebration of the revolution in July. Come down and play for the people. You know, no, no uh, hoo-ha or, or visa problems or anything. Just come on. 
And so we were all going to go down there and play. Uh, my band was a little itchy about going down because of you know the situation that was going on there. It's a war zone. But I sort of convinced them or, or, or bullied them in, into going. And then uh, Benjamin Linder, the first American uh, uh, who was killed in Nicaragua during the uh, Contra situation, uh, happened. And they all got a little more itchy. And I, was, I could understand and said, OK, I'll go down alone. Now I could see their wives sitting there saying, you're going where with Paul? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> you have children, you know. And I went down there and just had the most extraordinary time of my life. Again, like Paris, uh, as silly as that may sound, uh, it attracted uh, just this amazing uh, group of people, uh, from peasants to poets to uh, military leaders to the head of the Beijing Opera Association I traveled with at one point. Uh, um, and they had an international book fair going on at the same time, so it was just a thriving metropolis of, of ideas and people. And that's what I was looking for, and I found some musics down there that were very exhilarating. We'll probably do one of those songs tonight, actually, one called Carlos Fonseca, that's just very beautiful and sounds vaguely Russian, actually. But a, a lovely melody and just a beautiful poet, poetics uh, written by Thomas Borgay, who uh, I think then became the, uh, Minister of the Interior. But uh, something like, uh, possessed by the gods of fury and the devils of kindness, my heart goes out of this jail cell to the something in the thirsty for light. I name you my brothers in my hours of isolation. You come breaking down the walls of the night, giving something, uh, bringing light into the darkness. You know, just beautiful stuff. And that's the English, you know. <laughs> the Spanish is even more beautiful if you know Spanish. You will, um, you're a man who travels across countries seeking uh, those Just things, looking for trouble. Uh, like causing trouble and, uh, um, and looking for inspiration. But where does your inspiration come today? No idea. Mm -hmm. You don't know why you make, you don't know why you make music. I mean, it's a lifetime. It's very easy to learn how to make music. You know, you can get a chord book and dun -dun 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 kind of thing. But the, as to the why you make music, it's, it's, you, never, you don't really know, I don't think. It's so undefined in a certain sense. Nobody knows why uh, music produces an emotional response. Why this odd collection of mathematics, virtually basically cycles per second in various combinations, will produce a tear, a nostalgia, a remembrance, a glory to the future, a passion. And why that occurs is still a mystery to me, and I'm still exploring it. It's like in Fantasia, when, when Mickey Mouse gets a hold of the, the sorcerer's book uh, and starts doing things. And the brooms get out of control, and the water's all over everywhere. Music is sort of, for us, is like that. And you almost search for those times when the music does get out of your control. And, and, and it, takes, it takes you somewhere that you hadn't planned on. When you were going up on the stage that night, you didn't expect to go where it takes you. And that's, that's one of the, the, I'm still exploring that. I had the chance to see you play recently, and the show was terrific. But I think the greatest surprise to me was the connection with the audience and the fact that songs that you had written you know, 30 years ago uh, were clearly so moving to the audience. And there were a lot of people in that audience who, um, I'm trying to figure out a way to describe this, but if you saw them on the street, you, would, you might cross the street because you didn't want to buy an insurance policy. Uh, they, are, they are there with their arms raised in the air, you know, screaming, Volunteers of America. You're living their yeah. lost youth. Oh, and, and, and yet, I mean, the passion is undeniable. It's not, it's not nostalgia. It, you're touching something else inside. Well, a lot of those battles haven't been won yet. You know, it's an ongoing uh, struggle and, and fight. There, there are still homeless people in the country that need addressing. And um, racism still needs serious address. The military situation needs address. The death penalty needs address. Most of the women that I know far prefer the life imprisonment because it's much more horrible than that easy little shot in the arm. I mean, that's what we would all like is to just go peacefully to sleep and die. So I don't see that as a death penalty. If, uh, as George Carlin says, they bring back crucifixions and burning at the stake and beheadings, <laughs> then we have another question and why don't we get into show business. But short of that, uh, things like the death penalty, hunger, uh, the drug wars, the, 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 the atrocious number of children that are put in jail with hardened criminals for smoking a joint. And you create new criminals that you're going to release on the street in a while that are perverted and that are going to walk amongst your children uh, is a crime in itself you know, that, that needs to be addressed. So there's always a 
cause to fight, and uh, those songs address some of those causes that are not resolved yet. Is there a topic that you haven't been able to write a song about that you wanted no. to? You can address I can't everything think of a in music. Thing. George Carlin again says you can make fun of anything. <laughs> a anything will make you laugh. I think he brought up the concept of rape. He said you can joke about rape. Somebody said how? He says well consider uh, mini, uh, no, Porky Pig raping Minnie Mouse. <laughs> and you got to give him a few things. So it's how you address it, and with I think with what end in mind you address it, uh, and, and what kind of heart you have in, in trying to deal with the situation, rather than just bluntly going out there and being abusive, uh, which is one form of music that's going on today. Um, the, the, it, it takes a certain heart to address the difficult topics, with an idea toward accomplishing something, you know, that, that's worthwhile. Thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Our guest today has been Paul Kantner. I'm Ken Paulson, back next week with another conversation about free expression, the arts, and America. I hope you can join us then for Speaking Freely.